Mr. Teng Chi Wai. Yes, Chuang. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me over. So before you were big cheese at uh, Offin Huang Capital, before you were big cheese of a 50 billion ringgit AUM fund, who was Teng Chi Wai? Where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a humble beginning. It's a, a lot... A lot of times it's by sheer sure luck that, uh, that, that you would know where you will be eventually. Uh, I came back from Singapore, uh, not by choice, because I joined DBS in 2001, January. And they said, we have this rancher that did not work out well in KL. Can you go, can you go back to Malaysia and see what you can do with it? So I told them I, I am a fund manager. I, I have always been a fund manager, never been... I've been doing managing money. That's all I know in, in the last uh, in the past uh, 10 or 15 years before that. Uh, I have no idea how to run business. I have no idea how to run products. I have no idea how to do marketing. I have no idea of what is running and asset management is all about. They said... Just you just don't want to manage money. I just don't manage money. I don't know how to manage people. And no? you're fucking good at it. I am not good at it. <laughs> so I'm good at managing money. No problem. Managing money is just... That's what you so do. So easy for me. You, so you, get, you can get it's 30 just, times, 40 times, 50 times. That's what you do. Uh, I, I enjoy getting the beggars. I enjoy yeah. getting the 10 beggars, the 5 beggars. That's, that's really in me. Okay. I have in me. But before DBS, before 2001, where did it come from? Who are your parents? What did they do? What was life like when you were 15 years old? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm just an average Joe friend. I am nobody, okay? Yeah. Uh, I come from a humble beginning. My parents... Guess what? Which school did I study in? Where are you from? I studied in Cochrane Road School, right? Oh, yeah. And those days, in, in the 80s, it's known to be a naughty school. A Cochrane School? Cochrane Road School. Where is that? Right? Ipoh? Or no, or? it's in where Ikea today. They built Ikea on the piece of land and that's where the school field was. One day I was in, uh, I mean, you raised it. One day I was traveling um, with uh, Tan Sri, which is really a big time editor from one of the big press in Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, one of the big banks invited me to Hong Kong to be a panel speaker, panelist. And Tan Sri was also a panelist, and we shared a platform to basically talk about Malaysia to Hong Kong investors. Mm. At the end of the presentation, to cut the story short, short, he asked me, in one of the casual settings, so think, are you a Singaporean? I said, no, I'm a South proud Malaysian. <laughs> and I said, Where, where's your hometown? Malaysia. Which school do you study in, in KL? I said, Cochrane Road School. I said, when did Cochrane Road School produce a kid like this? Because he was a proud VI boy. Ah, I see. So that's the difference. That uh, when people talk about Cochrane Road School, it's always associated with people who are... It's a playful school. I mean, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they excel in sports. Uh, you don't really focus on studies. And when I was... I was I also always tell my guys stories of me doing my A-levels. When everyone has been busy taking, preparing for the last paper, which is a physics paper in my, in my A level, I was busy packing my bag for going for a camp, and I basically flung the paper because I walk into the, walk into the class exam hall, wrote my names, and then walk out from the room. Oh really? So you're not a good student. I am not a very good student as far as the teachers are concerned. So there's hope for people out there. To do. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's embarrassing actually to talk about it as yeah. a CEO today to say that, oh, this guy is not a straight A kid after all. He's a very playful kid. And because you, you come from a lower middle income family, you, you don't really, they don't really tell, talk to you about, your parents don't talk to you about career, about ambition. You grow up to decide for yourself what you want to do. Unlike the kids these days, where parents will send them for internship when they are 16 years old. Correct. Those days, our internship is about going to, to paint someone's house and get some money. Yeah. Right? <coughs> it's a very different, different environment altogether. And I learned through those environments to survive, actually. Do you remember what you felt like at 18? What kind of, like, um, what kind of things you desired? What kind of things turned you on? What, what was, was it about girls, only cars, or...? No, nothing, actually. It yeah. was just... It, playing games is like playing basketball, yeah. football. Yeah. Um, Travelling in motorbike is a luxury. Yeah, right? really, yeah. Taking yeah. buses is our regular mode of transport. Uh, when I get into a bus in the morning, you have to 
climb from the back door to the worst. Otherwise, it's jam packed with human beings, with kids, <laughs> and you can't even get in. Yeah. Hanging on to the corridor, to the to the to the mini bus those days. I'm not sure nowadays if you have not seen it, but those days you have mini buses, and when you get into a mini bus, you just hang on to the door, and the bus will be going on, and there's no the door doesn't shut. Correct. You just so you hang hang out, the hanging out from the bus, and that's the way to go to school, and yeah. you enjoy it. Yeah. Right. You don't want to go cram inside there because it's so hot, so you want to get as close as you to the door, <laughs> fresh air. you get fresh air. <laughs> but but those is those those are, are environment that I grew up in. I'm just a normal person. Yeah. Uh, but what made the change was when my parents then decided after air level, what should we do with you? What do you want to do in life? And I said, Were you fa- were you failing at the time? Were you flunking or I, were you just I mean, like obviously by physics I had an F because I didn't even open the first page of the exam paper. But uh, I was only fortunate that uh, I'm mathematically inclined. So being in that natural position. Um, whenever I, I sit for my mathematics exams, I typically get a, a distinction. Whether I study or not, it just comes very naturally. And because of that, I, have, I, I got my distinctions in my maths. And, and then a friend said, just, why don't you just go down to Singapore and study? And I said, why not? So I applied to NUS and I got in, they, they, they accepted me, but there's only subject or course that I can qualify to take on is mathematics. And my parents said, why don't you just go down there and try it out? I said, okay. But back then, to study in Singapore is very cheap. I remember the school fees, if I'm not mistaken, was about 1,008 Sing dollar. A year? A year. Incredible. And the exchange rate back then is one to one at the point when I went over. So, so, parents, so my parents said, ah, since it's 1,008, something that they can afford, why don't you go? But even at those type of price point, they struggle. And when I first went over to Singapore, again, it's my first trip out of Malaysia. Never traveled out of Malaysia before. Holidays back then is like going to Genting, going to Cameron's as holiday. And when you walk into Singapore as a kid carrying your bags, I remember with the bus stop at uh, Singapore General Hospital, and you had to ask, your, ask some other friends along to say, how do I get to NUS? And they show you the bus, you say, take this bus, you'll be there. So those are just experiences for me as I explore uh, to go out of KL and, and to be in Singapore for the first time. Uh, or, or in fact, in a matter of fact, in fact I, to be out of the country for the first time. And uh, I'm glad that I took that plunge because it actually opened up my perspective to life. And one of the most important things that I realized when I left was that finally it cost my parents something for me to study. I have, I cannot fail them. I must then be serious with my life, study hard and complete and get the degree. How old were you then? Then I was about 19 or 20 years old that I woke up to the fact that they are, they're going to put in this sacrifice for me. I must study. I must give them back the, 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 the I must complete the course and get going with my life. So was it purely fortunate that you fell into the world of investing or did you just, how did you get switched on to the world of investing? And when I graduated with mathematics, I asked myself, who would hire a mathematician in life? So your degree was mathematics? Mathematics. And I, of course I did very well. I was, remember I said I switched on and I studied and I graduated with a lot of distinction with all my subjects that I had. And when I, and I decided that I would, I would go out to work at the end of the three years and I have no idea what jobs I could get as a mathematician in Singapore. So I started asking around and said, what can I do as a mathematician in the private sector? They said, go and try shipping firms. They may need you, your, your, your skill sets to do routing for logistics. Yeah. Um, and one day I went to a job fair. They said, actuarial science. Be an actuarial, actuarial, go into this line of actuarial science. They need, if you are logical and you're strong in maths, you should be in there. And I said, I'm good in both these two areas. Mm. So I went around, went home, applied, applied to every single in, uh, insurance company to introduce myself, say I'm from this, this background, can I apply to be an actuarial trainee? And one firm replied me, and that firm is called NTUC Income. NTUC Income. And they said, come for interview. When I, I ran in, I got the job from them. And I asked them, I'm not qualified as, as an actuarial 
I mean, with my those days, actual science is very rare. And the MD back then told me that he saw my background and said that you are you you will be you 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 are good in your studies. Why don't you come in for year, one year, see what you can do in actual science? If you are good, I will send you to London to get your professional qualification. So I said done deal. I went in. Within six months, I could master the skill sets of actual science through self studies again. And I pick up the books, I could do valuation of liabilities, I could do premium calculation, everything that an actual, typical actual trainee needs to do, I managed to master within six months. And then, oh, nine, one year, they said, why don't you go to London to study? They gave me a, a nine months or a year off, I went. I studied in City University, get my professional degree, professional graduation back, uh, the, the professional uh, uh, papers back. And they said, when I came back, and I was ready to then pursue a career as an actuary, because I had all my associate's qualification. The day I stepped in, my boss said, there's no job for you in actuary. Oh, shit. <laughs> Go to do investments. In the same company? Same company. And I told him, boss, you spent so much money on me over the last 12 months. You paid for my education in London. Every week, you give me allowance to, to have my meals. Every week you covered my accommodation. On top of it, I was I was away. Every month you paid my salary. Incredible. And you and I just need to sign up for seven years bond with you. And now I'm back, ready to be a fellow. I'm ready to pursue the studies to be a fellow in actuarial studies. You said no job for you. Go to investments. And as I guess it's my generation. We don't question our bosses. When my boss said jump, you ask how high. Your boss say work late, you don't ask what time, I will get it done for you tomorrow morning. So I told my boss, if you ask me to go in investments, I will follow. But what do you want me to do in investments? Because I have no investment background at all. He said, you go there, look at all the theories that people talk about investments. Is it buying high PE stock does it make money? Buying high dividend stock does, dividend stock does it pay over time? Momentum theories. Test it out. Do a study for six months, then come back to me and see what investment theory works in the current environment. And I did that. Bear in mind, I have no idea what is PE. I have no idea what is the economics theory. I have no idea what is accounting. Zero. But again, within nine months or a year into the job, I pick up most of these skill sets, all through self-study. I, I get books in and I start reading about them. So actually, in, in that sense, I, I guess he, he knew, my boss back then knew that if he put me into a new job, I would not just sit still and say, I don't know. I wouldn't want to do it. I took the opportunity as a learning opportunity, and I picked up the skills. And similarly, when I came back to Malaysia in 2001, I told you, I, I don't know how to manage people, don't know how to set up organizations, don't know how to do marketing, don't know how to do product, don't know how to pitch at all. Again, when I came back, I started to learn, started to read, started to ask. And today, what you've seen in Afin Huang being a successful company is through a accumulation of self-studies, accumulation of testing on theories, and that's, what we got, that's, what we, that's where we got us here today. And my message to all my young people in the office is this, it's never too late to learn. Do not be handicapped by your past. You will never know the potential that you have within each of you. The only thing I ask is, don't be shy to try. Don't be shy to ask. You will fail at times, but it's okay. Because each is on your side to ask. Each is on your side to, 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 to try and fail. To try, and some things will work out, some things don't. Those that don't work out, just learn from it and move on. What are some of the um, best performing stocks that you chose? <laughs> um, in fact, when was the first time you bought a stock? Oh, I first started, my first stock that I bought was in 1990, I remember, when I was in Singapore. Then I was in, not in the investment department, I had some curiosity, I had some interest in investments, I'm curious about stocks. So I asked my friends about stock market, how, how, do, I, how do I invest? So they said, oh, open account, we have reminds you, I did that in Singapore. And, and when I wanted to buy a stock, I said, what? How do I buy a stock? How do I? What stock should I buy? I'm going to open up the, the, the page. 
in, in the paper. It's just so many stocks in there. That's right. Then I look, 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 look. Oh, this stock. I know this business. The company called Tancho Motors. They sell Nissan car. And that's where I bought my first stock. Just on the back of recognition. Recognition of brand names. I have no idea how to evaluate, evaluate stocks anyway. And I remember when I asked them, the, the price was 110. And I saw after I gave the order, I said, so how much do I need to pay? And they said, <laughs> it's, I buy one lot, it says 1,100 Sing dollar. I said, oh, okay, I just have 2,000 in my account, I got enough to pay for that. And the price went up to, I remember, I can't remember, it's 10 cents or 20 cents after that. I felt so happy I sold the share. I make 20, 20, 200 bucks out of it. So those were, that was my first experience, uh, dabbling with stock. And, and I remember um, what caught my attention was because I recognized the brand name. And I recognized that it's the one that sells Nissan car. So if you to advise people nowadays who are relative novices to the share market, what are the rules of investing in the share market? Top three rules. On a broad basis, the top three rules when you want to invest in shares is number one, um, you must always write your winners right? and cut out your losses. When you invest in stock market, you are bound to make mistakes. Don't hang on to your losers and cut your winners, which is what all of us would do in a natural way. Take profit, right? Take Close profit fast. Yeah. But then end up when you have losses, I don't look at it. Put it in the closet. I look at it five years later. Stay with the losses. You will then lose everything. Because the losses, those who are losing money, will wipe off your capital. Whereas the ones that you should be keeping are the winners. Are those companies that can grow year after year. That those companies can, that can multiply in terms of their capital base. Those are the ones that you should be keeping in your portfolio. Second rule. Second rule. You must remember is that stock market opens every year, most of the weekdays. And whether you will be with the market is whether you have capital. So second rule, never lose your capital. If you lose your capital, you will never come back to the marketplace. You must always learn that to fight another day, walk away. At times, do not over leverage. Do not get too emotional. Do you it. even recommend leveraging to buy no, the market? No, I don't. Ever, I, ever. I, I, I don't recommend. Unless you are a trader, you want to trade. Most of the time, traders become long-term investors when they lose money. When they're making money, they're a trader. Once they go into losses, they become long-term investors. That's when they get into even further trouble. I don't recommend people to leverage to trade, because I have seen disaster happening to them, to those people who leverage. Right? Because of discipline, they just don't have the discipline to cut out. Um, so then point number two is, remember, the market is there every other day. Right? Whether you will be there is whether you still have the capital or the risk appetite. So rule number one, rule number one write your winners, write your winners, cut out losses. losses. Rule number two, don't lose your capital. Rule number three? Rule number three, just that when you buy properties, it's all about location, local location. In investments, in stock market, it's about investing in management, management and management. That's your rule you number buy, one. That's yeah, rule yeah, number three. Yeah. You must buy what you know. Do not buy because it but tells you. You look at the company, the management track record, how they manage things, you'll be able to tell whether they will continue to be able to grow over time. So very important to get to know the management, very important to know who runs it, whether they are trustworthy people at all. When you look at the CEO and his team, what kind of things do you look out for? What gives you the trust in them that they are that they're able I to I see the people the around them. I, it's just meeting the CEO, they will tell you all the good things most of the time. How many people are honest to tell you when things are no good or when they struggle in the first meeting with you? Hardly. Most people, especially entrepreneurs that I know, is always positive. But when I look at them, I, was, I don't really look at them. I look at the people around them, who they surround with. I just get the chance to speak to uh, the finance people, the guys that runs the projects, and, and, and get a sense on how things are like. And I like to invest in um, companies where it's not just run by one person, but run, run by a group of people who are passionate about the business. And then that's when you get, you know that they will, they will do well over time. When you look at a person and look in his eyes, <laughs> do you 
Do you look at um, whether they're truthful? Do you look at whether how hardworking they are? Do you look at their backgrounds? There's many, many markers. There's many. I, many I try points. not to read too much on them because I'm not good at it. Okay. I'm one person that likes to have this belief that I give everybody a benefit of doubt in life, just like my staff. I told my staff some of the principles in life that I've learned over the years is number one. When they walk through the door with me, some one thing I will do is that I do not doubt their intention. I always believe that everyone deserves a chance in life. And as such, they should get the benefit of doubt from anyone that deals with me will always get the benefit of doubt in whatever they do. I do not question their intention. I like to believe that the intention is always good until that trust is broken. Then I, I, then I have the right to withdraw it. Number two, I told my staff when they walked through the door with me, their life, their career is my responsibility. It's just not just because they apply for a job, they are just part of the team. I owe them this little bit of making sure that during their stay with me, that I create the environment for them to grow and they contribute to the organization. But that's very personal. Because that's very much me as a person when I look at my staff. So when I look at individuals, I, I, it's very difficult for me to go with a very judgmental mind or a very judgmental mindset to say that I don't trust you or you must earn my trust before I... Before no, because all, C, all CEOs will tell you certain things, right? Oh, we're going to do and this, we're going to do that. No one tells you good news. Yeah. No one tells you bad news. No one and tells you bad news. No one tells you bad news. It's only through experience that after... And if I actually let you see my back, it's all scars. I mean, there are so many things that people tell me that have not come to pass. But did, it, did that kill me in terms of my portfolio performance over the last 25 years? No. You learn to manage as you go along because out of every 10 decisions, there will be four that will not work out. There will be six that will work out reasonably. So you just need to make sure that that six stays healthy. The other four, you manage your risk and if you need me, cut out the losses and move on. So look at the management team and look at them and, and be able to know that they can give you the returns over the long term. But how do you pick a winner though? What are the things that you look out for when picking a winning <laughs> stock? As you Is age, there a formula? As, there's no formula. There's no straight formula. As you age, uh, your preference of risk changes. When I was young, um, at the age of maybe in my early days of late 20s, early 30s, I'm very ambitious. We become very ambitious. We dare to take risks. We dare to buy the small names and say that this is it. Even sometimes you buy, I remember you buy a cassette. No, those is magnetic tape man, uh, manufacturer. You thought that would be a winner, but you did yeah. not know that it's a sunset industry. Yeah. That really doesn't exist. So things like that you learn, right? Um, and I learned over the years that some, one, some, one of my biggest mistakes back then was to buy product companies. With things that, that moves very fast, that changes very fast. That's so why today my investment uh, 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 skill sets or my investments preference, I try to avoid product company because I couldn't always, I couldn't get it right most of the time. Just like you see Warren Buffett, he doesn't want to buy a product company. It's only of late he bought Apple because of his new staff that came on board to say that believe in Apple and he give it, he let them invest in these companies. But you look at Warren Buffett, what is, what does he invest in over the years? It's about service companies. People who can build brand name, right? Because product companies tend to see evolution. Product's life cycle doesn't last too long. So product but company examples would be Samsung, Apple, um, Sony, cars, uh, Toyota. Toyota. You will find that these things comes and go. There will be a cycle where it does very well because the product is in the right space. Just like Mercedes, in the last three years. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Gone crazy they, look yeah. at the numbers, crazy. But do you think you can extop, uh, extrapolate that for the next ten years? Hmm, I don't. I'm think certain. So. Yeah. I may not. I may not. I, I challenge that you may not, because someone else will come with a new line of products, and it's, if they start to slack, someone else will take over the lead. So examples of service companies. A typical service company in today's environment will be the e-commerce platform boys. Okay. Those people that can create community, that trade within it. Ten cent. Whether it's ten cent, whether it's Amazon, Alibaba. Or sometimes it could be Microsoft in the space of the, com in, or that that will be the space of the commercial space, right? The users itself. So so it's all about. Uh, I I prefer the service sector at the moment, which I do invest a fair bit into them, uh, because that gives me more certainty of revenue, and um, certainty of uh, margins. At any rate, their margins tend to be very high. 
Uh, but of course, to build service companies is tough because it's all about how you build um, the customer base that you want and the, and, 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 and the service that you offer to them. So your specialty is the share market, but there's also other asset classes like um, the bond market, the currency market. Do you have strong views on any, any of those things? The, the, current, the current environment is such that, if you, that most of these asset classes are interlinked anyway. Today, you, you can't say that you want to look at stock market but ignore interest rate cycles. Right, you can't. You need to have a view on them. You need to have a sense of what the, what the macro drivers are. Uh, as such, for, for me, the benefit is that I have a team that covers uh, the, the macro, the fixed income, and I have a team that covers equity. So it, gets me, it allows me to leverage on both sides. Two years ago, currency plays an important role on investments. I read somewhere by UBS that if you look at currency um, impact on, on, on equity returns, um, in the last, uh, especially the last four or five years, um, currency itself would impact return by about 50-60%. Either you get it right, you get it wrong, it dilute a return by 50-60%. So you st- oh, so it yeah. forces you to have a view of currencies. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, basically these are new things that happen. In the past, when you're e- investing in equity market, you know what I tell you? People will tell you, forget about currencies. Just invest in stock market because the stock market gives you 12, 10, 12 percent return per annum. Currency impact is maybe one, two percent. No longer the case. No longer the case. I wish there were those old days where yeah. every 10 years you have one, two good years of bull market. No? Yeah, last time the ringgit was pegged, right? So you could just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, but now it's longer. Now you, I mean, look at 2015. If you have not handled your currency exposure well, you have even lost more money. So you need to learn uh, a bit about currencies. And we do have views of currencies. And I do, I'm not an expert in currency, but I follow it out of interest. So what is Ting Chiu and the personal man? Okay, and how do you personally invest your money? What do you do? <laughs> uh, I'm not a good. Uh, when it comes to my own money, it's not as disciplined as. Um, as what you do with clients' as I do money. With the clients money. Your own money, you 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 don't feel the fiduciary duty. Clients' money, I feel it. I I always think that we shouldn't manage other people's money like other business money, other and, and don't have that sense of responsibility. I feel a deep sense of responsibility for those money and it's the trust that they have given to me and I basically took those trusts seriously. It's not just about a man, some of my clients that can give me 100 million that I suddenly become endeared to them. The lady, the old lady that writes a 10,000 check, I ignore her, no. To me, they're the same. Because for the old lady that writes me a $10,000 check, that's probably all she has, right? The guy that gave me a 100 million check, he probably got another 800 million outside. But it doesn't matter to me. For me, every single dollar that comes through the door, we are entrusted with, with, with to handle them with due care. Um, and because of that, then I've decided uh, a few years ago that I will not invest outside of my company. I put all my savings in all my funds. And today, uh, because of that, I managed to convince my staff to do so. Uh, likewise, to invest in their savings into the funds. Because we live and breathe Afin Huang anyway. Every day we are there. Every day we look at our portfolios. Every day uh, we talk to each other about our portfolios. And I'm glad to tell you that in Afin Huang, our staff collectively have invested hundred more than 100 million of our savings into the funds that we manage. So the clients invest in the funds, we also put our money into the funds. So if the funds are not doing well, our wealth will be affected. But your industry is under siege, right? Because of all these robo-advisors. And they come in and they say, oh, you know, it can be as low as 0.2% management fee every year. You're charging, what, 0, 1 point something, 1.5, 1.4. The regulators know this. They want to cut down fees. They, they know that the unit trust industry cannot go on in the same way as, as it is now. So it's under siege. I'm not sure the word under siege is a correct word. Um, definitely, there are com- new competitive pressures that come through the industry. You look at the passive, um, the active investments or active assets in US, the developed markets, is declining. It, it has been growing for many years in the past, but it has been declining over the last few years as I observed them. And the big boys, whether the big boys that, that, that I've seen, they're, the, the, they're, 
they are coming under a lot of revenue pressure and cost pressure. Ask yourself, why did that happen? Why did the industry allow the passive funds to eventually take over that role? So you guys are active funds, right? Yeah. The passive funds are the ETFs and yes. the low-cost funds, low and they just basically what is you used to say, Indexing. they hug the index. Yeah. Index does three percent, mm. they will do roughly the same. Index does six percent, they will do roughly the same. Yeah. You guys try and beat the index, Correct. the alpha boys, alpha, yeah. right? Yeah. You know why did that happen in the West? Yeah. I learned it in my years in DBS yeah. that when I found out, I was completely shocked. In my early days, when I was in the insurance company, there's no such thing as in benchmarking indexing. You buy whatever you think is the best stock for your clients, for my portfolios. You don't buy telecom because telecom is 8% of the index. If telecom is not well managed, you have zero in them, so be it. You take what we call active risk. And I've been trained with that mindset for the first 15 years of my career. If you look at my Malaysian portfolio even back then, I don't need to own a bank if it's not well managed bank. I can own a small bank if it delivers a better returns on returns on equity and returns on and the profit growth is stronger. I can own more of the small bank. In fact, I could have zero of the big bank. Now that's what we call active risk. But when I did that, guess what the consultant tells me? You are a cowboy. Hmm. You have no disregard for risk. And I asked, who's the, the consultant? Oh, these are the big consultants. I better not name them, otherwise I'll be sued by people. <laughs> but these are big time consultants who are advising pension funds. And I asked them, what risk are you talking about? You're talking about benchmark risk. I'm prepared to take benchmark risk, but you cannot say I'm a cowboy just because I take huge active risk. My active risk could be 10%. It can be measured. But I'm prepared to accept it. 5 to 10% is my active risk. That means I can underperform the index by 10% or I can outperform the index by 10% at any one point of time. That's what I call active risk. But I'm paid to perform. I must give the investors a 5 to 5 to 10% outperformance to the index. That's why people will pay me for it. But guess what? In US, in all the developed markets, Compliance came in to say that your active risk should be only 2%. So what did the fund manager did? Most of them, they hugged the index. And But when you start hugging the index, you cannot be charging 1.5%. You can't do that. It's because the guy that's hugging the index only charge you 30 basis points. Because it's blind money. You don't need to do anything. Even if the company is not well managed and they are big and they're in the index of 5%, you have to buy the company and provide capital. That's the rule. That's part of the process. So I was fortunate I came from a background of someone that's not exposed or that's not forced to do those things. And as such, when I started Afin Huang Asset Management, I said, you will not be benchmark huggers. We understand the benchmark risk, we will take active risk. Even today, after 18 years of running Afin Huang Asset Management, I continue to believe in that philosophy. Always invest and buy what you believe the companies that can deliver us an absolute return, a positive return. Now, how can we know whether a company will be, share price will be up tomorrow? We can't. That's a random walk. But we will know in three years' time whether a company will deliver you a positive return if they can continue to deliver a 15% growth on their earnings for the next three years. Then you cannot get it wrong. They will be able to give you a positive return. So the trick is to know the company that can give you 15% growth a year on your profits pays you 5% dividend a year. Your total return over time will be 20% per annum. It's a simple maths. How disciplined are you about meeting companies and you know going down the factory floors and shop floors and meeting <laughs> management, shaking hands, having lunch with them, looking them in the eye? Those are big things. I enjoy doing them. I used to do many of these meetings in the past when I was actively managing money. Today, as I start, I mean the last seven, eight years when the company, when the business got bigger, it's a bit more difficult for me. To be very fair, I mean, I'm very frank with my clients. I, I, I don't manage, out of the 50 billion, I don't manage 50 billion, okay? I'm only managing 200 million out of the 50 billion. David and my team manages the balance. Close to 49.8 billion of it is done by my team. So today, I, have, I, I spend less time. Although I will always tell David, the day when I can step away 
from managing the business. And then sitting down there and managing money. I like to do that again. I like to go down to the factory. I like to meet management and see in their eyes what they're telling me yeah, about the business. Yeah. And I like to tell them that what they're telling me is true or not true. I like to go and talk to them to say that maybe this strategy doesn't work. That you consider other things. And I think the last 18 years of running the business gives me even more experience to do so. To know what works and what don't. So what do you spend most of your time doing nowadays? Having my whiskey, having my cigar, that's one of them. <laughs> uh, daytime, most of my time is spent on sales, going to see clients, um, product, product strategy, um, and then very little bit on investments. Um, investment is only Monday meeting I have with them, giving them my broad view of what I think about the markets, what I think about the macros. I do not spend much time on the on the micros in terms of the stock levels, but more on the big macro. That's what I spend my time with. Uh, planning for the company over a three, five year cycle, strategic cycle. That's what I do. Is there one thing that is different now than it was 10 years ago? Have things changed? People say that there's going to be recession coming. <laughs> uh, has you things changed? So? I think the last 10 years, um, I won't say 10 years, but maybe 20 years. Um, the only thing that I've changed is that there's just a lot of money today compared to before 2008. Capital, yeah. A lot of capital. Available. Unfortunately for, for both of us, the capital is only reaching those who don't need them. Those who need capital won't get capital. That's the irony of the markets. You, what do I mean? You look at <coughs> the companies that are doing well, they are flush with liquidity. But companies that may need capital, may be slightly smallish or medium sized, they ignore. Not, not, it's not easy to get capital for them. That's the nature of the market today. It's tougher for them. It's, it's, it's the convergence is towards getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's crowding out the mid-sized market. We have seen this in the West anyway. It's coming to this part of the world. And unfortunately, that's, that's the reality. And, and indexing plays a role. Imagine if every one of us just index, buy robo-advisors, allocate to the ETFs. What happened? Only the top 50 stocks on the exchange get money. What happened to the 950 at the bottom? Then what happened was, will be the 50 stocks trades at 25 times PE, the 950 stocks trade at 8 times PE. Because of what? A location of money. It's applying money as far as I'm concerned. It's really no-brainer. Right? That's what robo advisors will do. That's what ETFs will do. I think ETF has a good role to play in the last eight years or so. But I've gotten so big that one, regulators have to think about it. Because it will represent a misallocation of resources. What will happen that over time, as the global economy struggles the next 10 years, with a below average growth, eventually 10 years from now, people will say investing in stock market doesn't pay. Because ETF return will start to be dwindling down. Why? Because it comes at a very high PE at the moment. And earnings will not be able to sustain it. So what does Teng Chi Wei, the individual, do um, to... I mean, you, you come to a stage maybe in your life where you do a lot less active investment. You do a light touch with clients, maybe. You talk to your people. But then, as you say, you like your whiskeys, you like your cigars. Um, I presume you like your art. I presume you like your watches. Um, why? Why these things? And let's talk about whiskey first, right? What kind of whiskeys do you like? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I enjoy a variety of whiskeys. I'm not particular about my whiskeys. Yeah. Uh, only thing I like to drink it, I like to drink it neat. Oh, sorry. I don't mind a bit of ice, Yeah. Um, but I don't like to mix with water. Yeah. Um, as such, I like to drink um, a variety of brand of whiskeys because uh, I think that's give me the a little bit more taste to the whiskey. I don't like to bottle yeah, some whiskey. That's right. That's I, right. I think it's a waste of the effort by the by the, by the, by the whoever make yeah. it, right? So are you a Scottish guy? Are you a, uh, a Japanese uh, guy? Are you a Taiwanese? I blind, I blind taste everything. Blind taste, yeah. I blind. I I, I have blind tasting session for different whiskeys. So I, today, what what kind of stuff do you like? Um, of course, the Japanese whiskeys are always good. They're very distinct. They're very sweet. Um, I very like at the end of it, uh, but it's overpriced. I will never buy Japanese whiskey because I find it overly expensive. It's not worth the money. But if someone gives me a bottle, I say thank you very much, I will have it. Take it. Take it. 
uh, because it's very rare. Yeah. Whether it's a Yamaha 18 or the Hibiki 21, it's just expensive, period. Don't need to even try to argue against it. Not what, worth the money. What do you buy yourself? What is in your closet at home? Oh, I have every. I have a lot of things. I mean, I, 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 I believe that um, in the next 15, 20 years or more, each whiskey will be a rare thing. Aged whiskey. Because nowadays, they don't age give you statement. age. Yeah, they don't right. make an age statement anymore. Right. right? Yeah. Farmers These are reserve, all blended right? with three years, five years, right. eight years. That's right. The I, days of 18 I, or 15 or 21 now. Uh, I tend to believe the 18 strain one, the 30 year whiskies, will be getting rare and rare in terms of uh, supply. Which one specifically? Um, I mean, everyone is going after the, 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 the Japanese. Uh, they're going after the... Um, McKellen is doing a great job. Um, when you say, what do you say great up. job, what do you mean? Marketing the, the, themselves. The limiting supply? Limiting supply, okay. marketing themselves, creating the demand. Um, when the Chinese finally pick up with whiskies, I think there's not enough in the world for them to consume. And then the market will go the crazy. The market will go crazy. So the each whiskies will get less and less because you need to age it in the barrel for 18 years and there's not enough in the, out in the market. So it's I, a long time. 18 years is a long, long time. time. 18, 25 years. So I, I do have a fair bit of them uh, at home. Uh, 18, 25 different brands that I keep. Uh, it's more, more to us uh, for myself to enjoy when I retire. Uh, because I think that by then there will not be that many left. How old are you this year? 53. How many more years until you stop working? Uh, I like to believe that, um, in, the, in, 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 in investments, uh, each is at one stage, unlike many Correct. other Correct. You can just get smarter and smarter. You get smarter and smarter. You just learn as you go along. As long as you're very open, you get a uh, much better feel of the yeah, market. You can sense so. developments before you it happens. Sense. When you talk to people, talk to uh, companies, you ask a lot more intelligent questions because you learn along the way. Um, experience is accumulation of mistakes that I made in the last thirty years. Right, I will tell you that, and, and I, I'd like to believe that's true. Uh, and as such, I believe that if in the right environment, I could easily walk until seventy years old. Only 70? Me. Warren Buffett is 86. Um, uh, Charlie Munger is 88. <laughs> as, <laughs> um, long as, I, as, I said, as long as I would like to work, I think, uh, and I have the energy to do so, I, I would like to work. I would like to contribute to the investment world. Um, so you ask me, a lot of people say, so think, when will you retire? You have been, you're probably the oldest CEO in town. Did you, you ever have a retirement number in mind? Like, you know, some people want to retire with like 10 million ringgit. Ten million dollars. <laughs> I had that conversation with my wife in constantly on really? Monday night. Uh, yeah, yeah. On today is Friday. On Wednesday night, yeah. when I went home. My wife. It's said, your it's your typical personal finance question, right? What yeah. is your what is your number, right? I started years ago. She said when I dated her, she said she asked me when will you retire. I said when we hit our first million there. you will say it's enough. Cannot lah, uh, one million on <laughs> <laughs> She asked me that night. So what's next? I said, I remember telling her some years ago that you just 10 million, you're retired. Ring it. Ring it. Not and enough. Then For you, not enough, then right? I said, you have it, you have, you have more than that. So she said, you doesn't look like you're going to stop. I said, no. She asked me, so what's the next target? That I told her 100 million. Ring it. Ring it. And she said, let's wait. When you reach 100, you'll tell me it will be 500 eventually. Yes. So I, I have, I, I think it's always, always a moving target. I think what's important for me, you know, the, is is to just enjoy the pace of it, um, and make enjoy sure the chase. And I, 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 I don't really chase; it comes naturally. Um, I just enjoy the, the 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 creation of. Um, I enjoy the that when I create those wealth, I get to share with people. I get to make sure that my staff enjoys those wealth. Yeah, I I want to see my colleagues, my my, my, my investors also enjoy those as well, and I think that's probably take, give me more satisfaction than say that I just want to grab more and more for myself. That's not me. Uh, I I and, and they will tell you that they say that oh, they boss is a very generous boss, right? Uh, I say that I'm generous to you because of one thing, because they are younger than me, so that when I finally grow old, make sure you take me out for coffee, right? Because you all you are easily twenty years younger than me. To make sure that when I finally retire and, and I'm alone at home at the age of 70, please come by and visit me and remember that I took care of you when you were young. Right. So. Wristwatch check, what are you wearing? I'm wearing an IWC. Yeah. 
Do you like watches? I enjoy watches. Uh, yeah. I have not bought one for a while, but I do enjoy going around uh, looking at watches. And if I find, find a nice piece, I'll buy them. Yeah. Are you, are you more into the sports complications? Are you more into the, you know, the big brands? Um, why, why do you like watches? Uh, I just enjoy the, the, the movement, the, yeah. the, the, the face. Do you remember the first time you bought yours? Oh yeah, the I remember. Fir- the, first, the first significant the first, one you bought? The f- I remember it was in 2003 or four. I can't remember. That's yeah. around the time. When, well, I make, when I make some good money from, from the markets and I brought my wife out, I said, dear, time to have our first piece. We walked across to... Now it's called Fahrenheit, this is called Kiao Plaza. 2003-2004. That was the first time I spoke to you, remember? Yeah. I was in Bloomberg uh, and you were in uh, Huang, on, and Huang, yes, DBS. Huang DBS. I used uh, to call you and David for comments. Uh, correct. And, and you were 200 million AUM then. Correct. And, and, so I, and I told her, let's do something, let's buy a piece for ourselves. And I remember walking in there and I buy for myself a... Uh, 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 what did I get for myself? Uh, Jaeger. That's a big, that's a big first. Jaeger. Uh, back That's a then, very big a first. Goal, a white gold Jaeger was only about 21,000 uh, ringgit. And I walked next door for her. I said, There, you get yourself a Frank Miller, a gold Frank Miller. And it was 31,000. That was our first two pieces. And still with me. Those are significant first pieces. So, huh, so, so I said, <laughs> Let's do it. Let's for once do it and get yourself something nice. We never had that before. I've never spent money. In a big way for the first, until then, until and then I was still driving. Then? I was still driving a Proton and a Camry. She at was in a Proton. She, she was on a Proton, yeah. and that was in twenty o three. That was what was our twenty o three? That was probably 30, 37? 37, 30, no more than that, more than that. Thirty seven. Thirty seven. Thirty seven. Yeah. Thirty eight. That's when I decided. That we have made some money, or be slightly less than a million. Let's be nice to ourselves. Let's spend some money. So you got a you got a JLC. She got a. Um, uh, she got a family. Why the JLC? Why not something more conventional like? Um, Rolex. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm Do not I a fan. It? I'm not a fan of Rolex. Yeah. Why? It's too small for my hand. I just don't like it. I prefer big pieces. I like the forty-two mm watches and. Uh, the typical Rolex is about 38. Uh, That's so right. Not, That's not, right. Not, not the biggest is a 44 for the Cedar Rollers now. I, yeah, I, 43. Now, they're, they're the limited edition. That's when That's now right. they, they come out with the limited edition. Yeah. But it's so expensive, 60,000. That's right. For, for, a, for a metal case, it's yeah. crazy. But that's where the market is. That's the matter. I'm not a I'm not typical guy that would chase the market. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that everyone says that this is a limited edition, everyone is chasing it, I must have one. It doesn't matter to me. I, if I like it, I like it because I want it and I just buy it. Uh, it's not because it's the latest craze that I need to have it. So what then was your second, what was your oh. third? <laughs> I can't remember. Uh, that was, I mean, second, third, fourth came along the way and... Um, Is there a brand that you particularly like? No, I don't, I don't mm-hmm. have a brand that I like. I, I yeah. just look at, I just go around and if I find something that I like, even in Japan, you know, in Japan they sell very, ni- very, very good Second-hand pieces. Pre-owned, fantastic. Pre-owned, fantastic. fantastic place. This is a pre-owned watch, by the way. That I'm not. Like I'm not shy to tell everyone I wear pre-owned watches. That was a. Um, th- 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 what is that? It's an IWC. Yeah. I can't remember. And then big, this. big one. The big, it's the big, big cases. Big yeah. Cases. Um, moon face. Moon face. And when I went to Tokyo one day, and I ran to this shop called Best Shop, it sell watches on the few floors on top and at the basement. The market second-hand watches. I walk in there, I saw this piece, I asked them, how much does it cost? They said it's about 21,000 back then. Ring it. Ring it. I said it's mine. I bought it. Rose gold? Rose gold. Nice. So Beautiful. And I, since then, I brought all my stuff there to say, whenever you travel to Japan, let's go there and buy watches. I think all in finally, I think in the last four or five years, I think I bought easily 30 pieces of watches from there. For some of them are for my staff, some of them for myself, and over the years. And I taught them, the moment you change the strap, the moment you grind them, it's brand new. Yeah. No one would ever thought that you have a, you're wearing a There's pre-owned. nothing wrong with pre-owned. There's nothing, nothing wrong. wrong. Nothing it's wrong. only mindset. That's right. And you wear them, 
you still feel good. Yeah. So I bought for got my HR manager one day to go there, and uh, we, I think we were traveling in our incentive trip, and I told her, let's go and get a watch. So I brought her there together with some staff, and I picked for her um, Rolex Oyster, those pink pink color with some diamonds, and then for her piece, um, they don't have certificate. They are no boxed, papers. But no papers. Box, no papers. But, uh, but I told her Japan is okay. No problem. Because they are honest people. And I bought, and I know because when I buy watches from this shop, I can return back to them after four or five years. And they still give me the value. Because I've this been, is Tokyo? This is Tokyo. Shinjuku. 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 Okay. You look at Bass. Type Bass in Shinjuku. You BST. Can see the shop. BST. Yeah. And she bought it and, and she was reluctant to buy it. So I went there and said, doesn't matter. You take it. I pay for it. You underwrite it. And and, and then you go back to KL. Any problem, you let me know. You yeah. don't want the watch, just give me back the watch. You want, after one, two weeks, pay me the money. So after two weeks later, I asked her, so do you want the watch? Or of you course pay she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> say, I give you boss, I pay you. You know what? She went back to KL and she went around looking at the watch shops and said, how much is this watch? And end up, is, I think she paid easily like, seven, eight thousand, right? And I mean, it came back was like 15,000, and that was two years ago. Now it's probably 21,000 to watch. Yeah, yeah. So nowadays when I say, well, hey, can I get it back my watch, please? <laughs> <laughs> so you bought 30 of pieces from this place, mm. um, predominantly what, IWCs? Oh, or everything. IWCs, I have, uh, I bought, last year I went, I bought a piece of uh, Lang, 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 Lang number one. If I you have, say Rolexes are too delicate, Langes are way more delicate than oh, Rolexes. I love the Langes. Yeah. This has been my dream watch for a while. It took yeah. me a while to bring myself to buy Which it. Which one? Langes number one. Yeah. Nice piece. And Langes number one, you have to wait for the 42mm. That's right. Because the rest are coming at 40. So it's smaller. Right. So only, it one lang, only one Langes. One Langes. Uh, then I, I bought a fair bit of... Uh, actually, there's one nice piece I pick up. It's, it's called... Oh, what's the name of it? It's called... Uh, I can't remember. The, it's a very... very Independent very brand old, or...? Very old brand. They make watches for the Monaco, King of Monaco. Fashion uh, No, no, not sure. Um, I can't remember. JD. Eh? JD. Jack Dross. Oh, Jack Dross, okay. JD. Very, okay. very nice pieces. Okay. Very small piece, round. No, it's like number eight. Your wrist is at least an eight, million, eight, eight inch, right? At least. Yeah. Yeah. So I bought that piece again. Yeah. It was a very nice piece. I brought back and again I got it polished that nicely and everyone thought it's a very expensive piece. Yeah. Because it's a it's, there's a there's a serial number so area there's a limited supply. Uh but guess what? I think I paid only like twenty, thirty thousand for a rose gold limited edition piece. And I'm happy with it. I mean, I, I really don't really care how much it costs outside, but I enjoy very yeah, good. That's, yeah. that's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, then you buy something that you enjoy. Yeah. Don't buy something that's up to people's expectation. Don't would, leave to people's expectations. Okay. Would you do a watch collection video with me one day? <laughs> <laughs> I can, but I'm just embarrassed that they may not be that big, that expensive. No, it's okay. Pieces. It's just do five or ten. Just, you know, your favorite uh, five or my ten. Favorite five or they ten could be your favorite. They, they could be Casios. <laughs> they could be, uh, not that I'm thinking of <laughs> the old Casios, but. I can bring it and show you. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, and it's trip I go down to Tokyo. Fortunately, I have a, I have a Japanese partner. That gives me the yeah, excuse to go to Tokyo. Because you do stuff with um, one of the partners. Nico. Is, uh, yeah, Nico, Nico is my show. That's right. And I, and I get to travel to Japan very frequent to basically meet them. And I'll try to pop by the shop. And each time when I pop by the shop, my wife will say he needs four hours. Don't, don't 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 trouble him. Don't don't bother. Don't bother him. You will be there for four hours. Do I even dare ask you about art now? Because art is another one for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> not really. I I enjoy collecting them. I'm not the big art collector. I enjoy supporting the young artists. Okay. Uh, whenever I see a nice piece, I I, I will try to buy them if they're young young painter. Are you oils? Are you waters? Are you? I'm actually into oil. I'm actually into yeah. abstracts. I'm yeah. not. I I don't like painting that is. Uh, still, I don't like painting of painting of uh, of um, um, an object. I don't like it. Uh, I, I like painting that doesn't that, that is more abstract that de that depicts different things. When you look at it, you think. It just gives me a lot of calmness when I look at them. Yeah, I, I enjoy that that it, amid, amidst of all this. The turbulence of the financial markets. You come I home, you see, see some. some I, I, enjoy, I enjoy look at them. 
Uh, I do have some watercolor pieces, but I, 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 it doesn't tell me. Anything. It's just one piece of a nice watercolor painting. That's it. Right. Any names in particular you've been buying? No, no, I, I, I don't have any names. I, I buy mainly the young painters. Yeah. Whenever I see some young painters coming through and they have, uh, they, they have a potential, I just buy them and then hopefully every three, four years I get a piece from them and so that I can see how their stroke improves. Yeah. Because again, art is also improved with age. And That's experience. right. That's right. And I like to enjoy to, to enjoy some old art pieces when they first started to see how raw and bad is it and now after 15 years how interesting it gets is there one particular artist that you like I, to highlight the one that I bought a lot is uh, what's his name the, the Chinese painter from Penang uh, Alex Leong not Alex Leong the guy that draws horses with a lot of energy oh um, okay I don't know I don't miss him I, I have few pieces of his yeah. even my house you go to my house there's a Huge piece of painting, uh, easily um, 10 feet by 5 feet, 6 feet. Horses? No, orchestra, okay. using similar stroke, but with orchestra. So you can see the energy or the movement of the orchestra. You think Shui Man? Huh? You like the... the, the, the no, no, I like the movement. I like yeah. that, that, that. That painter in particular is about the stroke movement. That how he moves the strokes, it should depicts energy depicts movement. That's why he only he, he particularly uh, focuses on horses. And I, I love horses because I'm a horse, right? So yeah. naturally I do when I first started I tried to collect You own as, horses? You you bet on horses? No no I don't bet on horses. I don't own horses neither you don't own I don't horses? Own but I enjoy collecting uh, figurines of horses. I, I enjoy see, I see. if I get a get some, if I see some paintings on horses I enjoy having them. Uh, but I don't bet on horses. I it's not something that I enjoy. But the things you bet on are the financial markets. Uh, more than that, more than that. I enjoy uh, poker. I enjoy Texas Hold'em. Uh, it gives me fascinating game. You've got to be. Uh, <laughs> you've got to be pretty, pretty darn good at the game because it's a skill game. Uh, no, actually, and I, I think you'd be better to be lucky than skillful <laughs> I <don't think. laughs> in life. You know, especially poker. I, I, I have that. Uh, I do play quite frequently with friends. Uh, yeah. Poker. Yeah. Uh, well, I find it the best way to unwind, unwind my day. If I can have two, three hours of a game, I find it just enjoyable. So, so that's something that I do enjoy. Right? If we come to betting, you know, that's probably what I enjoy most. Yeah. So if there's one thing that the share markets are going to do in the next three years, there's one thing, and this, there could be any one of a number of things, right? Mm. Brexit, uh, China, um, I don't know, China, US, right? Mm. Um, million one things. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> oh, that's one thing. Um, one thing for sure. I, I think it will be seeing Trump coming back to as president of America. So you think he's going to get a second term? Yeah. I think so. Really? I think the world must live with him around, right? President Trump being at the most power seat, powerful seat of the world, and be interesting to see how he behaves in the second term. And my bet is that it's going to be different again. More measured. No, I don't think more so. More statesman-like? I don't think so. No? I don't think so. I think it's probably more risk for the global markets. Really? Incredible. Because I think that um, in the first term, he's probably had his eyes on getting re-elected for the second term. In the second Sing term, all the popular things. Do all the popular things, push through the hard buttons. But well, the second term, where he wants to stay back and leave behind a legacy if it's a legacy that he's looking out for what, is he, what does he want to leave behind that people remember him for right is it American first isolation of the other parts of the world to be seen okay man thank you okay thanks okay. Thanks for having thanks. me over yeah cheers bro Cheers, bro. Cheers, 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 cheers. The next thing we do is that we do a watch collection. No problem. I, I just too embarrassed <laughs> to bring them out. <laughs>